you know when we come from delhi uh, we were just discussing with professor shaji you know we we live in a polluted city hmm? environmentally polluted politically polluted lack of freedom hmm? and from that atmosphere when you come to kerala when it's a breath of fresh air without a doubt fresh air literally in terms yeah. of clean air but also in terms of openness and freedom but the fact that you have this freedom hmm, puts the responsibility on you to keep that space alive for god's sake do not take it for granted we we had much more freedom that you can imagine in kerala in jawaharlal nehru university it was the most progressive most open and as you know most defiant institution in the country even after the attack on jnu since 2016 when our students were picked up they are still in jail umar khalid is still in jail sharjeel imam is still in jail simply because is they are muslims hmm? they were two of our best students directly our students hmm? so the attack has been vicious since 2016 and yet two years ago i went to lecture i had retired long ago i'm very old hmm? and uh, i went for a guest lecture in my department and i found that there were out of 50 people about something like 35 or 40 were women and this is in 2000 you know 20 or 21 so i i said that how come you are all here because jnu is supposed to be a dangerous place the propaganda against jnu i don't know whether you heard it or not made by ministers that condoms lie all over the place girls dance naked you know and what all happened in jnu and terrorists are trained so much so read the newspapers as i said as a historian whatever we say can be footnoted read the newspapers of 2016 17 you will find that many people taking a taxi from the railway station to want to come to jnu would be refused by the taxi driver saying we don't go to pakistan that was the kind of vilification uh, campaign that was made in jnu and yet i found so many girls there so i said what made you come hmm? you know what they said the girls said we came here because we feel that we can come here be free and fight we were able to create such an such an atmosphere but it is almost dead hmm? so it can be killed so it is our duty to utilize every space in a democracy hmm, which is still available if we do not use that space as has happened historically the world over that space closes hmm, it shuts down so as i said that don't just bask in the glory of the freedom you have hmm, please maintain it as i was saying yesterday even nations have to be maintained it's a process if you don't maintain the nation the nation also blows up so is so for democracy and civil liberties etc i'll speak on jawaharlal nehru in today's context not historically what all he did but how why is he relevant today why are, why are we even discussing jawaharlal nehru i must tell you another incident i was invited by uh, one of the top universities universities in delhi again i won't name it hmm? there is no point in naming it to give a talk on jawaharlal nehru hmm? it it was a memorial lecture hmm? so so i said i'll speak on jawaharlal nehru and the making of modern india hmm? everything was announced and then two days before the program the person who invited me very progressive a very fine scholar herself she rings up and says professor can we drop jawaharlal nehru's name hmm? you can say whatever you want but our vice chancellor is saying that you know having jawaharlal nehru's name in your lecture is too risky so i said look i am going to say what i either you find another speaker hmm? i am going to say what i have to say she said that is okay hmm? what we will do is we will just you just, we'll give the title as the making of modern india will drop jawaharlal nehru's name so you can imagine that it takes courage even to invite a person to speak on jawaharlal nehru these days in many parts of the country such has been the demonization you don't feel it because you know nobody thought here that there will be any you know professor shaji will lose his job for calling us firstly 
by the way even that is a crime as you know in many parts of the country professors have been suspended for inviting jnu speakers i'll give you another example in madhya pradesh seminar was organized on something as safe as the scientific temper you would think it is safe to have a seminar on the scientific temper not on secularism communalism or hindutva so it was not the scientific temper and the speakers were gohar raza he was a very senior scientist in the csir the council for scientific industrial research training and a uh, professor apurvanand he is a professor of hindi in delhi university a very progressive public intellectual a group of lumpen uh, youth belonging you can guess to which organization went and told the went to the police and said this seminar cannot happen otherwise because they have invited these two people they are anti nationals there will be trouble so the police goes to the vice chancellor and says you can't have this seminar because it will cause trouble vice chancellor says look this is an international seminar people have been invited it is online you know what kind of trouble are you were you anticipating say no 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 you can't have it so then when he insisted he said you are having it at your own risk if there is any trouble you will, we will you will be responsible etc etc so eventually the police actually came into the campus ensured that students don't even use the computers because the seminar was online the foreign partner said we don't care we are going to have it you know so it would be available on the net so the students were not you know you you would think you are sitting in uh, where 1930s germany you know or in some stalinist situation where you know if, if even if you are seen in a particular place you your uncle and aunt and everybody will, will be you know butchered you know it's it's that kind of a situation you know i mean i couldn't believe it that this is happening in my country that you cannot even have a seminar on the scientific temper just because a group of louts say that this is not allowed so you have a freedom which we must maintain nehru as you know is being demonized in a manner which is unthinkable there is a website if you just google dismantling nehru a website called dismantlingnehru.com and page after page lies negative reporting the, the, the website shows a picture of nehru smoking a cigarette you know hmm? as if smoking a cigarette is in one of the biggest crimes as ever has happened in the country hmm? huh? and there is a book called 97 blunders of nehru hmm? and this number keeps increasing we started when we first saw this book it was 80 then it has become 85 75 it started with 75 now it has become 97 hmm? where nehru is portrayed as a westernized womanizer photos are shown of nehru hugging women you will see this in the net websites hmm? and who are these women one of them is his niece one of them is his sister you know so but who knows for the public they are just showing these pictures saying that look he is womanizing and so on and so forth hmm? and in fact this website says that uh, dismantling nehru says nehru the last englishman in india hmm? so he is supposed to be basically a colonial plant of course you know and unfortunately it is not only the hindutva walas who do this as i said yesterday we must take responsibility for a lot of the bashing we do even the secular people do without much thought so nehru is supposed to be responsible for all the evils in the country lack of bad bad primary education nehru concentrated on higher education he ignored this problems in agriculture nehru concentrated on industry he ignored agriculture you will find so many people argue this sensible secular people not only as i said mad caps you know so he he ignored agriculture he ignored education he screwed up the foreign policy in china in pakistan he did everything wrong india is poor because of nehru his economic policy was wrong he was too protectionist 
etc., etc., and all that. So bad was he that uh, one person, uh, a BJP member, and this is reported in an RSS magazine, so I'm quoting you a source which is impeccable for this uh, piece of information, said that Godse actually aimed the gun at the wrong person. It should have been Nehru, because he is even more dangerous than... That is right. Somebody who was a BJP candidate from Kerala actually said this. Uh, I didn't want to mention that. Not even the colonial masters of the current communal parties, I want to emphasize that as I did yesterday, there is a primordial link, if you like, hmm, between colonialism and communalism. Hmm. Uh, even the colonial masters did not treat Nehru in this manner, despite the fact that he spent 30 years of his life struggling against the British, nine years of that in jail. But you will not find in British writing, colonial writing, the kind of abuse that you find the, the supporters of colonialism, the communalists, doing for Nehru. Now, if Nehru was all that bad, why did Gandhi choose Nehru as his successor? The father of the nation must have had some reason. Why did he choose Nehru as the successor? In a speech at the AICC in 1942, as early as 1942, 25th January 1942, Gandhi said the following, I'm quoting him. He said, somebody suggested that Jawaharlal Nehru and I were estranged. This is baseless. And then Gandhi, as you know, always used imagery which immediately made the point very clear to everybody. He says, you cannot divide water by repeatedly striking it with a stick. In other words, he's saying that Nehru and I are like water. You cannot just divide us by striking it with a stick. It's a very important thing. Because if you look at the discourse of the Hindutvavadis these days, they're always finding divisions within the Congress. Gandhi versus Nehru, Bhagat Singh versus Gandhi, Nehru versus Subhash Bose, hmm? you know, Patel versus Nehru, as if the national movement was each person fighting against each other and not the British. Hmm? It is a way of demeaning our national movement. Why? Because they were not a part of it. So the actual national movement has to be demeaned. You have to have these starlets like Kangana Rao and such like people say, that real freedom came only in 1914. Did, were you aware of this? Uh, and she is a star. Hmm? After saying that, I'm sure she got a few more uh, supporters, you know. That real freedom came in 1914. In 1947, we got a So with one sweep, you've converted from Bhagat Singh to Gandhi to Namudripad to Harkishan Singh Surjit, everybody as a beggar who were just begging in front of the British and achieved nothing. And only in 1914 did we get real freedom. So Gandhiji is saying, Bhai, that there is no such division. He goes on to say, it is difficult to divide us. I have always said that not Rajaji, not Sardar Ballabh Bhai Patel, but Jawaharlal will be my successor. He doesn't choose two of his most brilliant and most ardent supporters. He says, but Jawaharlal will be my successor. When I am gone, he said, he will speak my language. Why does he say that? Because Nehru is already always quarreling with Gandhi. Nehru's autobiography is a critique of Gandhi. These guys don't understand that great people can have differences and still be together for a bigger cause. For them, if you have a difference, you must be put in prison. So Gandhi says that when I am gone, he will speak my language. And he says, even if this does not happen, I would at least die with this faith. Now, why does one Gandhi want to die, have such faith in Jawaharlal Nehru? We believe that it is because Nehru quintessentially represented and fought for all the seminal or critical values of what 
Rabindranath Tagore called the idea of India. He represented them and fought for each one of them. Now, what are these? What is the idea of India? If I may quickly summarize for you, bear with me if I am being repetitive, but it's worth you know, knowing what we are fighting for. Not just saying idea of India, but what is the content of idea of India? The idea of India is what the Indian national movement unanimously agreed upon as the future vision of the country. It's important, unanimously, as you know, the Indian national movement was a wide spectrum of people. Communists at one end, socialists, uh, Congress socialists, Nehruites, Gandhians, liberals, capitalists, you know, there are Jamalalal Bajajes also in it. Hmm? So here is this national movement, this wide national movement. It has revolutionaries like Bhagat Singh, it has non-violent non-violence uh, believers in total non-violence like Gandhi hmm? and as I said it has uh, communists, tall communists of that period, T.C. Joshi, Namudripag, Harkishan Singh, Surjit, I'm just naming you some that you would know automatically but there's so many, so so many more. Hmm? They were all agreed on this idea of India. There was a consensus. The only people who did not agree with this idea of India were the loyalists that is, those who were with the British and the communalists. They were the only ones who did not agree with this idea of India. Now, what is this idea of India? It has, in my understanding, five basic features. There are many other elements, but consensus was on five basic features. The first, obviously, the future India will be a sovereign country. It will be independent. It will be anti-imperialist. It is not that after having won independence, we will capture the, our neighbors and make them our colonies. Hmm? We will fight for freedom of everybody else, as India did after independence. For Vietnam, for Korea, wherever there was imperialism, they fought against it. All right? So sovereignty would be a value. Number two, democracy. From very early on, 1890s, Tilak, as young lady I was talking to yesterday will remember, the 1890s talking of adult franchise. Nowhere in the world yet, Europe was to wait several decades more to have adult franchise, to give women a vote. The United States is still debating in the 1960s whether the blacks can sit next to you, leave alone vote. 1890s, the Indian nationalists are saying the future India will be a democracy, a republic where each citizen, irrespective of their religion, caste, language, gender, religion will, will have a vote, right? Hmm? That is democracy was the second. And tied with the idea of democracy, it is uh, conjointly uh, connected is secularism. Because you cannot be a democracy unless you are a secular. You cannot say that we are a democracy but only the Hindus will have a vote and the Muslims will be the second class citizen. Then it's not a democracy. Hmm? So secularism and democracy are necessary. You cannot be secular without being a democracy and you cannot be a democracy without being secular. That is why those who are not secular hit at democracy. Don't be surprised that why the communal parties are not secular, are not democratic. Because it is bound to be. Because you are only empowering one section against the other, so it cannot be a, a democracy. In the colonial period, the phrase was used together. They used to say secular democracy. There were magazines called secular democracy, for example. There were two phrases which went together, just as loyalism and communalism went together. People have forgotten this because the communalism, communalists are now shouting nationalism from the rooftops. And people have forgotten that they were the loyalists, however much they may claim to be the nationalists today. Third or fourth element of the idea of India was a pro-poor orientation. Not socialist, I'm choosing the phrase carefully, but pro-poor. Because the whole spectrum, I said there is a consensus. Dada by Naruji onwards, I mentioned yesterday, poverty and un-British rule in India, early nationalist, any early nationalist you read, Surinath Banerjee, Dada by Naruji, R.C. Dhat, whoever, you'll find the poor are in the center. Gandhi, Nehru, socialists, 
communists, Bhagat Singh, all are agreed the future India we're looking at will be one which will keep the, their face turned towards the poor. They were not agreed on how we will do it. Gandhi had one way, the communists had another way, but they were agreed on this. And the fifth element was that the future India would have a modern outlook. It would not be based on obscurantist, on superstition, on faith. It, it, this is what Nehru gave it a term. He called it will be based on a scientific temper. Now, as you have will dis, dis, realize, all five of these elements, all five are today threatened. The idea of India is threatened. And, and Gandhiji saw in Nehru a person who would fight for and create in the new India all these values. What I'll do quickly is go through now and show you how Nehru actually practiced and evolved these ideas into the modern Indian nation as it was being born and how we are undoing it today. When you evaluate Nehru, the f one of the first things that you have to do is to use a term which economists use. Look at what was the initial conditions. Where are you starting from? You, you cannot compare apples and oranges. You can't compare somebody who's starting from level Y with somebody who's starting from level X, hmm? right? So what are, that is why the initial conditions are important. What are the initial conditions in 1947? Ravindra Tagore had anticipated this. He said, and quoting him, the wheels of fate will compel the English to leave, to give up their Indian empire. But what kind of India will they leave behind? What stark misery? What waste of mud and filth will they leave behind? So at independence, we were left with mud and filth. 92% of the women were illiterate. 92% at independence. The average life expectancy, not for the rich, but the average life expectancy in 1947, believe you me, was below 30. People died in their 20s on an average. Four years before independence, 3 million people died of famine. Immediately after independence, we had to import 10 million tons of food just to prevent famine. And on top of this, we are born in the middle of a holocaust. 5 lakh people killed, 6 million people made homeless. Hmm? You are having a virtual civil war, the partition period. So that is what you inherit and you have to build the idea of India on top of that. A secular, democratic, progressive, pro-poor, scientific India. So it was an enormous task. So, the, so start with the humility when you begin to evaluate. Not the way scholars do. Are, are elite scholars, elite, Gandhi was elite, you know, Nehru was elite, the Western eyes, tha, ye, wo. As I said, they, you know, this, there is no sense of history in many of the historians. When they evaluate people, you do not evaluate them where they are. Try and put yourself in, your, in their shoes. You can never write history unless you, try, you cannot put yourself in the shoes of the period or the discipline or the issue that you are uh, uh, trying to study. The biggest challenge, therefore, obvious challenge at independence was saving the secular character of India. From 46 to 48, if you just take these two years, we is, that's why I use the term Holocaust. This was like the Holocaust in Europe, in Germany. Hmm? Mass killings, the starts in 46 with the Calcutta killings, then the Noah Khali riots, and in response to that, the killings of Muslims in Bihar. Hmm? And then to top it all up, hmm? the partition, where again mass killings are occurring. Hmm? And all this is the icing on the cake is the murder of the Mahatma himself hmm? by, as our textbook will say, by one man called Godse. Hmm? 
But it was not just one man called Godse. It was a man called Godse with very close links with the Hindu Mahasabha, with the RSS and with Savarkar. Again, it's not Aditya Mukherjee saying so. Sadar Patel said, I'm quoting him, it was a fanatical wing of the Hindu Mahasabha directly under Savarkar that hatched the conspiracy to kill the Mahatma and saw it through. All right. Now, what lesson can we learn from this period? How did our nationalist leadership at that time deal with that period? And then we may have some answers to what we should be doing now. What was Gandhi doing? Gandhiji, when the killings in Noakhali started, immediately went there. And this is happening, Noakhali, you know, is, was, is, is in what is now Bangladesh, a remote part. And he started walking with, where, in collaboration with the Muslim communalists, the Hindus were under attack. And since the state was behind this, there was nothing that Gandhiji could go there except to stand with the, the Hindus, the, those who were being oppressed, and share their sorrow, give them courage. And he would go from one village to the next village to the next village, walk. Walk. Never would not sleep in the same village the same night. And increasingly he gave up. His companions had only one or two with him. And when there would be, uh, you know, they would try to obstruct him, they would throw broken glass and uh, human refuse on his path. He took off his sandals. He was punishing himself that what India have we created, where such barbarity can occur. And when the leaders came from Delhi and said, Gandhiji, when will you come back? This is the critical period, 46, transfer of power is going to happen. The biggest event, as I told you yesterday, in world history of the 20th century, the British Empire is about to fall. And the man who made it possible is in the villages of Noakhali. So they said, Gandhiji, how long will you be there? He said, as long as it takes. Hmm? And you know how long he was there? Four months. From November to February, he was in the villages of Noakhali. Hmm? He says, what use is this freedom if the soul of India has been destroyed? The soul of India for him was Hindu-Muslim unity answer to the question that again came yesterday, that Gandhiji was communal, because he said Ram Raj. What was Nehru doing? He was the Prime Minister of the interim government. When the reaction occurred in Bihar, he went with his entire cabinet, Sadar Patel, Rajendra Prasad, Maulana Azad, Jayaprakash Narayan, Acharya Triplani, all of them went and landed in Bihar and said, until the riots stop, we will not move from here. They gave the leadership. It was not they themselves who stopped. <laughs> the entire party was galvanized into ensuring that the riot stopped. Nehru, in his famous speech there in November 46, said, I will stand in the way of Hindu-Muslim riots. <laughs> Members of both communities will have to tread over my dead body before they can strike at each other. What a contrast. Now you see the contrast. 40 kilometers from Delhi in Dadri, a soldier's father is dragged out of his house on the mere suspicion of what kind of meat is in his fridge and he is lynched. Was our nationalist national leadership from left to the right sitting there? No. Today, this is now a few years ago, few weeks ago, Right next to Delhi, in Nu, which is the Muslim-dominated area, a riot was organized by forcing a procession where it should not have been, and so on and so forth. A lot of provocations were given. And then the victims were, which is very curious, the victims were punished by demolishing the Muslim houses, shops, etc. At a time, 50 bulldozers were there. Bulldozer Raj, Yogi Adityanath says. Huh? So, 50 bulldozers were demolishing Muslim houses. Again, not me. 
the punjab and haryana high court took so moto notice of this and said it appears i am quoting verbatim it appears that a state supported ethnic cleansing is happening in this area so something like that is happening but what has been our political reaction think about it so this is what we can learn from our national movement when something like that happens you cannot just say it is very bad hmm? the, the political leadership has to act in a manner learning from this experience nehru also understood that gandhi ji's assassination was just not one madman uh, going and bumping off the father of the nation he wrote to the chief ministers in february 1948 within a week of gandhi ji's murder he said it appears to him that a deliberate coup d'etat a deliberate coup was planned involving killing of several persons not only gandhi ji and the promotion of a general disorder to enable the hindu communalists to seize power you see if the idea of india was to be implemented then the communalists would be nowhere with the partition riots they saw a situation that here communal communal tension is at a peak if we can promote it more then we can build a hindu rashtra in india in as a mirror image of muslim pakistan hmm? so they were trying to create that situation hmm? and nehru said be careful he said that this is a threat to the very idea of india dreamt by our freedom fighters but nehru and the nationalist leaders was not going to let that happen despite as i said the worst situation when communal temperatures are so high they were not going to let the communal parties to take advantage of it what does this what do they do nehru and patel first thing they do is they ban the rss they put 25000 rss people in jail first thing and then more important because nehru's method was a democratic method not suppression they were let off after a while hmm? he converted the first general election in 1951 within 3 years of the partition riots just imagine and gandhi ji's murder a general election which he converted into a referendum hmm? went to the people he traveled 40000 kilometers those days hmm? and he spoke to one out of 10 indians at that time that is he spoke to about 3.5 crore people hmm? just nehru himself and just imagine what the others were doing campaigning and asking the indian people that do we want a secular india hmm? or do we want the mirror image of pakistan do we want a hindu rashtra or do we want a secular india do we want the idea of india or do we want the idea of communalism hmm? and the indian people voted overwhelmingly for a secular india 94% of the votes went to the secular parties only 6% of the votes went to all the hindu mahasabha jan sangh ram raj parishad etc etc put together they got 10 seats out of 489 in the very first election despite so this was the victory this was also the result of a 100 year old struggle because in the people's mind the idea of india had sunk in it was not going to die off just because of the provocation of the of the riots it was a stunning achievement communalism was pushed back but unfortunately it was not uh, extinguished unfortunately never since then has the issue of secularism a secular india protecting the minority became has ever been used in an election as a central point not even today we are coming close to it today we are beginning to say that we must fight against divide division hmm? against those those who todo india hmm? we have to join people we are beginning to say but you know at least thank god for it because we are now reaching a civil war kind of position i am not being alarmist 
This is Gregory Stanton, founder director of the Genocide Watch. He, in the American uh, US congressional briefing, says, We are seeing in India the beginning of what would be by far the largest genocide in history. We are pushing division in a society where there are 200 million Muslims. And if you push, if you push, if you push beyond a point, you, you go for a civil war. Nobody, not even the Americans were able to suppress even tiny little countries like Vietnam. You cannot suppress a people. It's, it's the madness of dictators and imperialists that they think that they can suppress people. You know, it, it can only lead to civil war. So, therefore, the need to fight against it before that war situation comes is so very important. And Nehru had anticipated this. He said, if fascism ever came to India, it will take the form of majority communalism. Now you know why Nehru has to be bashed, why Nehru has to be dismantled, because he's anticipated that he had been warning about this. The second le lesson to be learned, so first lesson we learned from Nehru is that we have to fight for secularism, fight, you know, with our lives for secularism. Second lesson is that we have to fight for democracy. India has now reached a situation where the world is not accepting us as a democracy. Please, please understand that. You may think in Kerala that we are a democracy. The world doesn't think so. We are 108 in the democracy index today, in 223, much below Nigeria and Tanzania. We were 27 in 2014. From number 27 in the democracy index, we have come down to 108. There are 177 countries above us who have better democracies than us. All right? So they don't call us a democracy. We are called a flawed democracy. These are the VDEM Institute, the Economists uh, Evaluation. There are a number of agencies which measure democracy. So they are now, the, the VDEM Institute is now calling India an electoral autocracy. They don't even use the word democracy. You have elections, but you're an electoral autocracy. And the downgrading has been done on the following grounds. Because they give the reasons. Again, you can Google all this. Just Google Democracy Index, just Google VDEM Institute, and you'll get all the figures I'm giving you. Hmm? Uh, this downloading was based on the government promoting anti-minority feelings and anti-minority conflict. And the decline in civil liberties, that is freedom of the press, freedom of expression, and the freedom of civil society organizations to function. As you know, Amnesty International has been thrown out. You know, any, anybody who does any good work, their funding has been stopped. We are in the freedom of speech index, we have scored even lower. As you know, it, it, these days we score, score low, not high. Hmm? We have scored 161 out of 180 countries. We are touching the rock bottom in freedom of speech. We are below, and this will shock you, even Pakistan in freedom of speech. In contrast, for Nehru, democracy and civil liberties were non-negotiable. He says, I would not give up the democratic system for anything. I'm quoting him. If civil liberties are suppressed, a nation loses all vitality. He was the one who founded the Civil Liberties Union in 1936. And he also made it very clear what he means by free press. He says, free press doesn't mean that I allow the press only to praise myself. <laughs> that is not free press. Free press means allowing the severest criticism of oneself. And Nehru said, saw that when not enough criticism was coming of him, he would, with a pseudonym called Chanakya, hmm, criticize himself. He'd write in the press saying that Nehru is this, Nehru is that, he's making these mistakes, that mistake, etc., etc. Hmm? Because he said, what is a democracy if there is no opposition? Create the opposition. At the peak of his popularity in 1950, he says, I am not afraid of the opposition in the country. I do not want India to be a country in which millions of people say yes to one man. See his prescience. I mean, he's able to 
predict almost what is going to happen, you know, half a century later. Hmm? I want a strong opposition. He is not talking of opposition mukt, Congress mukt, left mukt, this mukt, that mukt. He says, this is, I'm quoting again, this is too large a country with too many legitimate diversities to permit any so-called strong man, some dabang shakti shali man, to trample over the people and their ideas. His contributions to building the institutions of democracy, like the parliament. He would sit through entire sessions of parliament. See the contrast. You know, Prime Minister doesn't even go there. He would sit through even when he was ill, after the 1962 attack, answer each question on China. Again, Google. All of it is available. All the debates are available, parliamentary debates. See how long he sat and how long his answers were. And how much he gave importance to the opposition, how much he praised the opposition. He praises Atal Bihari Bajpayee when he criticizes him and saying, I like this young man. He has the courage to oppose. I gave you an example of Gandhiji praising the communists when they differed with him. Hmm? That was the tradition. Because democracy means dialogue. Democracy means the allowing the opposition. He encouraged the cabinet system. C.D. Deshmukh, who was his finance minister in his autobiography, has written that if we went to Nehru and said, you know, Nehruji, what shall we do about this? He would scold me and he said, you are the minister. You take the decision. You can discuss with me, but don't ask me. Now look at the contrast. I mean, that is, all decisions are taken, you know, where? The press was to be free. No cartoonist was put in jail even before he drew the cartoon or cracked a joke. Or, as you know, in the Kerala journalist case, before he even reported, he's going somewhere to report and you arrest and put him in jail. Hmm? Now, this was unheard of. The number of cartoons, again, Google cartoons on Nehru and C. The number of, amount of fun that was made of Nehru by cartoonists, especially Shankar. Hmm? His legion books are there on that. That is what a democracy was. An independent judiciary, and most important since I am talking in a university, Nehru said, freedom in the universities is critical. If you go to JNU, you will find there is a statue of, J of Jawaharlal Nehru, and below that statue, some of these lines that I am going to read out are written. This is what Nehru says. A university stands for humanism, for tolerance, for reason, for the adventure of ideas, for the search of truth. Each word is important. Adventure of ideas, freedom, search for truth, tolerance, allow dissidents, allow any kind of view that is there. He says, if the universities discharge their duties adequately, then it is well for the nation and the people. But if the temple of learning itself becomes a home of narrow bigotry, and petty objectives, how then will a nation prosper or a people grow in stature? The statue is still there, these words are below it, but the university is attacked. Students picked up and put in jail, faculty harassed for their political views, their leave not granted, their pensions not given, an atmosphere of complete fear, leave alone adventure of ideas. Fear is sought to be created. It is to the credit of our teachers and students in JNU that even today, they do not submit to that fear. They fight, they pay the price, hmm? but they still continue to fight. And this silencing of universities now is happening, not only in JNU, it is happening, I gave you two or three examples already, in large parts of the country. That is why I say where it is not happening, hmm? it is your duty to expand your space and set an example to the rest of the country. Coming to the third element of the uh, idea of India, sovereignty, independence. Nehru was very clear that political independence doesn't mean independence. In 1947, I'll give you just one figure. To make any investment, how, do, how does a country grow? You have to invest. For investing, you need machinery. India produced no machines. 95% of even machine tools, that is your pliers and wrenches, had to be imported. Where will you get the machines? From the same countries from which you've got independence. This is what is called neo-colonialism. You get your political independence, but economically you're tied to the same people. So Nehru said, 
this will not do this is not independence therefore the nehru mahalanobe strategy which emerged in the second plan a plan where we will build our own capacity to manufacture machines the hindustan machine tools the bharat heavy electricals the bharat earth movers idpl hindustan antibiotics and the whole range of public sector organizations were created at that time so that we made our own machines and look at the dramatic results before people dismiss nehru hmm? at independence almost 100% let's say 95% of capital goods or machinery had to be imported to make any investment to have any growth possible by 1960s only 43% by 1970 only 9% had to be imported that is within 25 years 91% of the machines required to invest and grow were being made within the country that is what nehru does is he unstructures colonialism having one political independence the next stage was to gain economic independence unstructure the colonial economic structure he also realized and that is what gave us the capacity to have an independent foreign policy lead 100 countries in the world against the two superpowers that will neither be the 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 stooges of american imperialism or of soviet domination 100 countries you could do it you couldn't have done it if you, if you were going begging to both these countries for survival and this was realized in the area of food that you if you were with a going around with a begging bowl for food which we were in the 50s and 60s then you could not be an independent person and here also nehru takes giant steps complete lie that nehru ignores agriculture if there has been a lie the biggest lie is this the first thing that nehru does is the land reforms institutional reforms something a 200 year old system of zamindari is abolished within 7 years the back of the zamindari system is broken by 1957 it required the constitutional amendment to do that also it was not easy and it is not done the way it was done in soviet union or in uh, japan or in other parts of the world that is by force you didn't kill lakhs of kulaks it had to be done in a democracy it was not an easy task but i will not uh, he also laid the grounds after doing the institutional reforms that is the land reforms land distribution etc he made the next stage of creating the conditions for the technological reforms that is the green revolution the green revolution strategy was started in nehru period itself the invest the intensive agricultural district uh, program as it was called iadp was started in nehru's time so again it's a lie that it's only after lal bahadur shastri came that green revolution started no you could not have had the green revolution if you did not have irrigation if you did not have the dams if you didn't have the tractors if you didn't have the diesel engines so you needed all that and that is what he what nehru did i will end by just quoting you all heard of daniel thorner daniel thorner uh, all students of economics or history have to read daniel thorner because he uh, like the other person called wolf ladijinski were two of the closest observers of india's agrarian situation in the 1950s and 60s all right daniel thorner was a communist uh, who was thrown out of america because of uh, mccarthyism and then spent a lot of time in india and then france he says the following i'm quoting him it is said that the initial five year plans neglected agriculture that is nehru neglected agriculture this charge cannot be taken seriously the facts are in india's first 21 years of independence more has been done to foster change in agriculture and more change has actually taken place than in the preceding 200 years so in the first three plans he says more change has occurred than in the last 200 years so this is as i said it's one of the blatant lies that nehru ignored agriculture lastly most important nehru realized that true sovereignty will come only when india is also self reliant in science and technology it's not only machines 
that you are able to make machines, but you also have to break breakthroughs in sciences. So if you see the first plan, second plan period, 50s, there he's not only building dams and uh, steel plants. This is the period the IITs, the IIMs, the Bhabha Atomic Research Center, the National Physical Laboratory, the National Chemical Laboratory. I mean, I, I, my throat will go dry. You know, every possible institution that you know of came up in this period. Even the first atomic reac reactor, the first atomic reactor was critical in 1956. We must remind ourselves of this. You know, a country which is left with mud and filth in 1947, you know, low levels of education. From there, you are able to have a crit atomic reactor critical by 1956. The rapidity of change was absolutely mind-boggling. The first rocket, since everybody is talking about reaching the moon, was fired while Nehru was still alive, 1963. It is because Nehru anticipated the knowledge revolution he anticipated it by nearly half a century that India is able to now participate in the global information revolution. I hope you know that today nearly half our GDP comes from the service sector. It is not industry or agriculture. It is the, the leading sector of the Indian economy is the service sector. And what is the service sector but based on knowledge? What is one of our biggest exports? IT. Knowledge based. All right. So Nehru anticipated this. It is another matter. You know, they say that, okay, Nehru did all this, but what about primary education? He didn't do that. Again, a complete fallacy. Pick up any textbook and see the growth of school education in the Nehruvian period. The destruction of school education that has occurred in this country, the handing over of public education to a rapacious private sector. Yeah, I'm not talking about Kerala is an exception. Kerala and Himachal are the two exceptions that Amartya Sen has immortalized almost. Hmm? But in the rest of the country, handing it over to the rapacious private sector is a recent phenomenon. It is, don't put it on Nehru's back. It is another matter that despite this anticipating of the knowledge revolution and the massive investments made in education, the benefits of that, we are not in a position to uh, a sustain or even take advantage of. We have reversed the situation. In the Nehruvian period, people from all over the world came to India to acquire cheap higher education. Hmm? Now, all Indians, lakhs of them, hmm, go to all parts of the world to give a, get a medium level edu education. In unheard of places, till the Ukraine war happened, I didn't even know that so many Indian students are sitting in Ukraine, in China. So what we have done? We have undone this thing. And the premier institutions which produce knowledge, we have encouraged them to migrate en masse to the West. To get into an IIT, you have to be some kind of a genius, right? ISER, IIT, the very, very tough places to get into. So out of a billion people, the cream gets there. <laughs> and then that cream is taken off and placed in the first world. So out of the sweat and blood of the Indian poor, which subsidizes this education, we produce a youth who we do not even know how to use. We hand them over and pat ourselves in the back, saying, wah, wah, wah. Hmm? See, our children are all over the world. This is what is colonialism in a new form. Please understand, colonialism is not export of raw materials and import of manufactured goods, what you were taught in class 5. Hmm? Colonialism is taking away whatever is the critical factor of production at a point of historical time. In the 16th century, 18th century, India was exporting textiles, manufactured goods. Colonialism in the pre-industrial era was grabbing whatever, what was in the pre-industrial area, era, the critical factors of production was land and labor. So colonialism was grabbing other people's land. The entire continents of America, for example. Grabbing other people's land and calling it discovery. And then grabbing other people's labor, slavery. That was colonialism. No export of <laughs> import was happening there. 
it is in the second phase that this phenomenon occurs of export of uh, manufactured goods and import of raw materials, etc. Today, the critical factor of production is not land, labor, or even manufactured goods. What is the critical factor of production today? What makes a country great today? Knowledge. We are a knowledge society. We are a post-industrial society. Advanced countries are throwing out their industry. Say, you produce. We don't want to produce this dirty, environmentally polluting stuff. More, more Toyota cars are produced outside than Japan than in Japan. They don't want to produce that. The US is right on top because they are now creating research triangles, the, the best minds, the best universities, the best technological breakthroughs. All right? And we are handing over our knowledge and saying, wah, 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 wah. In other words, we are patting ourselves in the back for colonizing ourselves. Boy, don't we need an Nehru. Hmm? Lastly, the scientific temper. The worst that is happening in our society today is the abandoning, complete abandoning of the scientific temper. If your tallest leader can go and say, we knew plastic surgery in ancient India, otherwise how would an elephant trunk come on a human head? You are making an assault, a state assault on scientific temper. If another tall leader, governor of Bengal, who is now the vice president uh, of the country, says, in an engineering fair, he says, Arjuna was able to win the battle because Arjun had a nuclear tipped arrow. So we had nuclear technology. Arjuna had. Mind you, this is being said by people who are educated, who hold positions. So, you, we have reached a situation where the state leaders, big leaders tell you how to fight Corona. With cow dung, with cow urine, with dip in the Ganges, with banging talis, thalis, with saying, Corona, go, Corona, go. Hmm. No, don't laugh. All this is in the newspapers. I can show it to you. Whereas Nehru was setting up the National Institute of Virology in 1952. In 1952, we set up the National Institute of Virology, which enabled India becoming the largest antivirus producer. And, and instead, we are now seeing a state-sponsored travesty of the scientific temper. Last item, poverty. Nehru was very clear, he was never to lose track of the need to uplift the poor. As he put it in 1952, if poverty and low standards continue, then democracy ceases to be a liberating force. It must therefore aim continuously at the eradication of poverty. In other words, political democracy is not enough. It must develop into economic democracy. So Nehru was very clear that it, it has to be uh, simultaneous steps, and it took giant steps in that direction. The biggest anti-poverty measure that happened in the Nehruvian times was the land reform itself. The land reforms, the community development program, the public sector, the, the emphasis on health and education, etc., were all meant to be in that direction. Most important for poverty, as Amartya Sen has pointed out, was the maintenance of the democratic system itself. Democracy is not to be seen only as a political thing. Democracy ensured that India's path of development could not leave the poor out altogether. Because you have to go and seek their vote. That is why we do not have an inflationary strategy of growth like in Latin America. You know, that is why we have not had, like in China, millions dying Millions dying of famine because we have a democracy. We still have a certain amount of free press. One death in Kalahandi and it is all over the newspapers. All right? So by maintaining democracy itself, Nehru was able to uh, move in the direction of uh, keeping the poor into account. We are at the moment completely abandoning that path. We are doing a lot of just beating, saying that we have the richest billionaire in the world, second richest billionaire in the world, largest number of billionaires in one country, this, that. We are 
सपोज टू बी डूइंग फेमसली इज इंट इट इकोनॉमिकली है विश्व गुरु वी आर अबाउट टू बिकम वी आर अमंग द लोएस्ट इन द वर्ल्ड इन द हंगर इंडेक्स प्लीज लुक इट अप जस्ट टाइप हंगर इंडेक्स एंड सी वेर वी आर वी आर हंड्रेड एंड सेवन आउट ऑफ हंड्रेड एंड ट्वेंटी वन कंट्रीज इन द हंगर इंडेक्स एंड टू योर ग्रेट शेम all of those all of you who feel great nationalism as how quickly india is progressing we are below every other south asian country in the hunger index bangladesh pakistan even afghanistan and sri lanka nepal we are the lowest in the hunger index half our children go uh, are malnourished in this country as i'll just end by saying nehru's fantastic effort to raise india from what tagore called the mud and filth left behind by the british has now got replaced with the indian people being pushed back into the same mud and filth of ignorance obscurantism disempowerment unfreedom and communal hatred thank you